this uh, as practical as possible without going into the science uh, that, it, that has been developing very fast uh, in the last uh, four or five years in the field of the understanding of the molecular basis of uh, primary uh, aldosteronism. And therefore, for those of you who are not uh, in the molecular field, this will be more relaxed. So I will go into all these uh, points uh, one by one very rapidly in the attempt uh, to dismantle a number of uh, misconceptions and myths in the field of primary aldosteronism. And uh, therefore, let's start uh, with the first one. We were taught that uh, secondary hypertension is very rare and this is not the case, and is not particularly the case for primary aldosteronism, which is uh, uh, much more common than commonly perceived. Uh, in the PAPI study, which we ran in this country with uh, the participation of the hypertension centers of the Italian Society of Hypertension, what we found was that primary aldosteronism accounted for 11.2% of the cases in patients who were referred to these high blood pressure centers. And even more importantly, about half of the cases were due to the surgically curable uh, subtype, which is uh, aldosterone-producing adenoma. And uh, this is not an isolated observation. At our center in Padua, which is a referral center for the northern eastern part of Italy, now we found uh, secondary hypertension in about 25% uh, of the cases, and the vast majority of, the, of these cases are due to primary aldosteronism, about 14.2%. So this is not an uncommon uh, disease. The second uh, point is why, therefore, are we underdetecting primary aldosteronism? And uh, the main reason for that is that we were taught that primary aldosteronism presents itself with hypokalemia, which is not the case nowadays. Again, I'm referring to the, prime, the puppy study data, and as you can see here, uh, in these three bars uh, on your right hand left side uh, right hand side the majority of the cases are uh, nowadays presenting with normokalemia which is a fact that, that dr con has pointed out uh, 60 years ago already. I have no time to discuss the reasons why hypokalemia is no longer a hallmark of primary aldosteronism, but this is a fact. So if we uh, restrict our screening to the patients with hypertension who are hypokalemic, we lose beforehand about half of the cases. The other point is, is it primary aldosteronism a feature of stage 2 or 3 or perhaps resistant hypertension? And undoubtedly, uh, the prevalence of primary aldosteronism increases with the uh, stage of high blood pressure. Here you have normal blood pressure because the patients were prepared pharmacologically with a long-acting CCBR and an alpha-1 blocker. So they had normal blood pressure at the time of the screening. So uh, as you can see from the uh, yellow bars, uh, the prevalence is increasing going from uh, let's say mild hypertension to stage 3 hypertension but in absolute numbers the vast majority of the cases are to be found in those with mildly elevated or stage 1 hypertension which, has, which are of course more prevalent. The other point I would like to stress is that primary aldosterone is, is not a benign condition. For the same degree of blood pressure elevation, uh, the patients with primary aldosteronism get uh, far more target organ damage. 
This was a finding which was somewhat unexpected in 1996 when we reported uh, the, the excess prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy in hypertension and then in circulation because at that time the prevailing idea was that if you have low renin, which is a feature of primary aldosteronism, then you could be protected from target organ damage. And as you can see here from this entire list of uh, uh, involving basically all target organs of high blood pressure, Evidence for this excess target organ damage has been provided everywhere. And uh, not only that, primary aldosteronism is, is associated with an excess rate of myocardial infarction, a relative risk of 6.45, and even more so with an excess rate of atrial fibrillation for reasons uh, which I cannot address in detail uh, now in the interest of time. And this is why now we are searching in the PAFI study the prevalence of primary aldosteronism in the hypertensive patients presenting with lone atrial fibrillation. But uh, of course, uh, surrogate endpoints uh, could not be convincing to all of you, and uh, therefore I'm uh, quoting this paper which was carried out in Germany, the Kohn's uh, German Registry, lead, led by uh, Professor Martin Reinke in Munich. And as you can see here on your left-hand uh, side panel, those with primary ald aldosteronism, which were 300, in the long run had more events than those who had hypertension and, of course, than those who were normotensity controls. This is a retrospective study, but the data really are convincing. And as you can see on your right-hand panel, when you have in the primary aldosteronism patients more risk factors, the uh, detrimental effect of aldosteronism is still clearly there. So primary aldosteronism is not a benign condition and for this simple reason it should be detected as soon as possible. Uh, is it challenging to treat and cure? Let's look at this data, this study we published a couple of years ago where we had long-term data on echocardiography in a rather large series of patients with primary aldosteronism who were assigned to adrenalectomy or medical treatment based on adrenal vein sampling and then compared with patients studied at the same time in which primary aldosteronism had been ruled out conclusively. And as you, and we, I will show you the follow-up data in terms of blood pressure here in the three groups. As you can see here, uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure went down uh, consistently and remarkably in all three groups, but the fact is that 45% of those who were surgically uh, treated were completely off of medications, whereas in those who underwent medical treatment and, of course, in those with the primary hypertension, the need for blood pressure medications went up over time. So this decrease in medication referred to the group still on medications who were surgically treated. Is it challenging to, uh, is it worth doing the diagnosis from the economic standpoint? I put here uh, two uh, cases of a guy, 50 years old, who got a timely, a timely identified aldosterone-producing adenoma and went through all this diagnostic workup with these costs in euro and then had the adrenalectomy and then had, uh, if uh, he was not cured, one drug on average at follow-up 
In comparison with, with a guy who did not have a, a timely diagnosis and therefore went up to 2.2, 2.7 antihypertensive drugs for the remaining 30 years of his uh, life expectancy. And then uh, we compare the cost based on these assumptions which are shown in this slide, 24,090 uh, euro in the misdiagnosis patient versus 7,000 in the one receiving timely adrenalectomy. So uh, this is really cost effective, uh, not even considering the cost for, prevent, for the complications who might involve the patient not timely diagnosed. So is it difficult to diagnose? And I'm coming to the point. Part of the difficulties uh, are related to the guidelines, uh, which are, in my view, a little bit too complicated. A new version of the, di of the guidelines are expected uh, shortly. And, uh, of course, as you know, in the diagnostic workup, uh, the uh, major place uh, is being held by uh, the aldosterone renin ratio. You might forget of this part, which is uh, um, to be uh, performed in selected cases and anyhow at referral centers. And in this area, the most critical point is to be aware of the effect of a number of conditions and drugs that affect the value of the auto renin ratio, as pointed out in this table, which unfortunately I don't have the time to review in detail. The screening protocol, however, is very simple and is depicted here. Uh, the most important thing is that the patient adequately prepared from the pharmacological standpoint is allowed to stay quietly sitting or lying for one hour before the aldorinine ratio uh, is measured. And the aldorinine ratio, in contrast to the uh, expectations, is a highly reproducible test, as shown in this paper which we published a few years ago, provided that you are measuring aldosterone concentrations and renin in the proper way and you prepare the patients as I said before and provided that you remember to measure urinary sodium excretion at the same time which is critical for the interpretation of the renin and aldosterone value. We have new data in this area and the new data come from the availability of an automated chemiluminescent assay which measure direct renin concentration and plasma aldosterone concentrations in the same uh, assay by using as uh, little as uh, 300 microliters of plasma in an automated uh, platform based on uh, two different type uh, of assay, a sandwich assay for active renin and uh, a competitive assay for aldosterone. And uh, with this assay, we ran a, a prospective study on 260 patients, which will be presented today in a poster in a late breaking session. And as you can see here, uh, patients with different forms of hypertension were clearly uh, discriminated using the aldo renin ratio based on uh, direct renin concentration and the automated plasma renin assay. And in fact, the ROC curves for the two assays are shown here, and uh, as you can see here, the uh, area under the curve was really very high for both assays, the one based on plasma renin activity and the other based on uh, the direct renin uh, concentration, but uh, there was a small difference in the two uh, 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 area 
which reach uh, uh, statistical significance in favor of the aldorinin ratio based on the direct renin concentration. So this led us to propose a simplified diagnostic approach, taking into consideration that the aldorinin ratio it carries quantitative information. So if you have an aldorinin ratio which is above 100, speaking of nanogram DL per nanogram ml per hour of uh, plasma renin activity, you actually do not need to go into all the confirmatory tests. So now I'm getting a little bit nervous because I'm supposed to show a video and I was told to start the video by clicking inside this and I don't, I don't have a, a mouse to do this. Uh, taking into consideration that the question I get uh, always is how can we convert uh, from one assay to another, we developed this app which will be available through the Italian Society of Hypertension soon and hopefully through the uh, European Society of Hypertension and the, perhaps the International Society of Hypertension soon, which uh, allows you to calculate uh, the aldo renin ratio and and uh, uh, the probability of uh, aldosterone producing adenoma. So this will be available to all of you through uh, these uh, societies. And uh, I think I can leave the take home message uh, there and I will, will be help, uh, glad to take uh, questions. Thank you very much for your attention.